Blog Talk Radio. Bichamo apura kanu apura kaitnut ne ye eguada medende o girafo kwesi rana muta akan akwamuman amaruka tipi mu o girafo o giramai mu. Greetings to all apura kani apura kaitnut people, many Africans, black people. Today is egua day, marketplace day. My name is Ojirafo Kwesi Ranehem Pata Akan, Ojirafo of the Akwamu Nation in North America, within Ojiraman, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakaitni, people in the Western Hemisphere. Yet I say we thank you once again for tuning into the broadcast. Chat room, if you have any questions or comments in the chat room, you must log in as a user in order to interact. If you have any questions or comments on the phone line, simply hit the number one so that we we can see that you your your hand is raised. Uh, we have four broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have Akan Fo Nana Song, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestry Religion, on Joda on Monday nights, where we deal specifically with the Akan expression of Nana Song Ancestry Religion. First and foremost, because we are Akan. Secondly, because of the misinformation being propagated regarding Akan religion, ancestral religion, Akan culture, Akan energy, the nature of the Ananoman, Samanfo, the deities and ancestral spirits, and the supreme being, Nyamewa, Nyame, as well as the creator and creatress, Nyonkonpon and Nyonkonton, the grandchildren of the supreme being, misinformation being propagated in the Western Hemisphere, but also those on the continent of Afuraka, Afuraka, those Akan people have been infected with Christianity, Islam, Judaism, white culture in general, and accepted those infections. Those who have done that, their presentation of Akan culture and cosmology and ancestral religion is infected as well, and it's been woven into their presentation. So therefore, we deal with ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion, which deals with our ancestral origins in ancient Kana the title of ancient Nubia, our people migrated from Kanat to Khan land 2,000 years ago, migrated to the western part of the continent, reestablished the Kanat or Ghana Empire in, the, in that region. A thousand years later, some of our people migrated further south, reestablished a Khan civilization in the regions of contemporary Ghana and Ivory Coast. And hundreds of years later, some of our people were taken from those regions forcibly into North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe during the Musuo Kessie, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era. And this is how Akan people ended up in the Western Hemisphere. However, we maintained our ancestral religious practice in our blood circles since we arrived on these shores. Thus, the Akan tradition is called Winti in Suriname. South America is called Obia. In Jamaica, it is called Hudu, from the Akan term Undu, meaning roots medicine, medicine from plants, roots, plant life, and so forth. It also means to become heavy with the spirit through spirit possession and kanche or conjuring. It is hoodoo in North America, ancestral religious traditions, intact for hundreds of years through our spirit genetic blood circles, intergenerationally, transcarnationally, through successive reincarnations through our, our clan. So we've maintained our priesthoods, priestesshoods, as who do men, who do women, root men, root women, conjure men, conjure women, and so forth. We've maintained our entire tradition intact. We're not dependent on anyone outside of our direct ancestral blood circle here in North America for our Akan ancestral religion. So this is what we deal with on Joda Monday nights, ancient authentic Akan ancestral religion, Akanpo Nanasong. On Benada, Abenada, Tuesday nights, we have Ojira, which means purification. We deal with ancestral religion in general, not just the Akan expression, but ancestral religion or Nanasom in general, no matter what form it takes, whether we deal with our people on the continent of Afuraka, Afuraka, or our people in the Western Hemisphere who have maintained our ancestral religious traditions, not just the Akan tradition, which is Hudu, but the Yoruba tradition maintained in the blood circles of our people in North America is Juju. The Ebe and Phone tradition is Voodoo. The Ovambo tradition is Wanga. The Ngangain tradition is the Fang tradition. The 
Gola and Kisi tradition as the Gullah and Gichu tradition and so forth. So we deal with ancestral religion, how it impacts every aspect of our lives. Ojida means purification. So we talk about purification. Ojida operationalizes nanasom. Purification operationalizes our practice of ancestral religion. Ancestral religion, in essence, is the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. That means through ritual we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. The ritual incorporation of divine law, the ritual restoration of divine balance. Incorporating those things to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order and rejecting those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions. So the ritual incorporation of divine law, the ritual restoration of divine balance, these are the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion. Ojida, through purification, Ojida, we operationalize nanasom, operationalize our ancestral religious practice, operationalize the ritual process of incorporating law and restoring balance to every thought, intention, and action. This animates our culture. We live to execute our divine function in the world given to us by Inyamewa, Inyameo, Amen, Amen, the Supreme Being. And we seek to align every thought, intention, and action with divine order every moment of every day. When we make legitimate mistakes, we engage the ritual process to incorporate law and restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions, and thus realign ourselves with order. This is how ancestral religion impacts every aspect of our lives when we are seeking to align every thought, intention, and action with divine order every moment of every day as we live and execute our divine function and creation. So the Ojida broadcast, we purify concepts, purify cosmology, purify the understanding of our religious practices, inclusive of how we have inherited and transmitted these ancestral religious practices in our blood circles in the Western Hemisphere. Therefore, we understand that no one outside of our direct blood circles can give us our ancestral religious practice. No one can give us an Orisha. No one can give us an Obosom. No one can give us a Vodou and so forth outside of our blood circle. We are born into the world, incarnate with these Obosom, these divinities, these Orisha Vodou connected to us, assigned to us by the Supreme Being. And we have maintained those ritual practices to transmit that to me or Ashe, that divine power, through our ancestral clans of our direct blood circles. So that's what we deal with on Ojida broadcast. On Yada Thursdays, Yada Abada Thursday night, we have Amain Sim Affairs of the Nation, and we deal with specific issues that are confronting us as an Omain, as a nation, specifically Ojida Amain, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere but we deal with our issues from a nationist perspective, an Amanie perspective. The term Amanie means nation, customs, and so forth. We utilize that term defined as nationism, which, of course, is the purification of nationalism. It is an approach to nation building rooted in our ancestral religious values, understanding that a nation is an Oman, a nation is a living, breathing entity, like an organ governed by specific Abosom Orisha Vodou forces in creation that maintain that organ and the children of that organ, the quote unquote citizens within that organ, the cells, they interdependently function, they interface with one another, but at the same time, they support the functioning, the overall functioning of the organ of which they are component part and the divinities that govern that organ. So we understand that we as an Omai and a nation are part of a living, breathing entity when we are drawn together by our Nananum Samanfo, spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, to coalesce in a specific region of the Earth Mother's body, in this Western region, we interface with the Earth Mother divinities, Asaseyafu and Asasiya in this region, incorporate their unique expression of energy from this region of their body, incorporate the plant life, animal life, mineral life from this region of the Earth Mother's body, blend those ancestral blood circles and bring ancestresses and ancestors back into the womb and into the world 
through this blending of ancestral blood circles in this unique region and, of course, the unique manifestation of the Abosom, the Orisha, the Vodou in this region of the Earth Mother's body, that confluence of events causes us to forge a locative identity, a unique expression of Afurakani, Afuraikani culture born of our circumstances. And thus we have a unique approach to our issues, solving any issue that confronts us as an Omai, an Afurakani, Afurakani nation, Ojira mind, specifically the purified Ojira, Omai nation, mind, land of the West, the land of the setting sun, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. So that's what we deal with on the Amain Sim Affairs of the Nation broadcast. Tonight is Awukuda or Akuada, which is Wednesday night. We have Egua, which means marketplace. We showcase Afurakani, Afurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions, those who are serving the Afurakani, Afurakani people, nation, in a positive capacity, but also who maintain their ancestral religious values in the context of that service. So we've showcased a number of businesses, organizations, and institutions, and we'll continue to do so. We also talk about on this show the philosophical foundation for our approach to economic development, institution building, and so forth, rooted in our ancestral religious values. We have published the Okom Economic Development Model, which is an economic development model rooted in our ancestral religious values. Therefore, there's a holistic approach to economic development. Part of that process, the operationalizing of that process, includes our starve the beast and feed the pride operation. That means we make an assessment on a weekly basis to determine what funds we would have potentially wasted with the whites and their offspring, and then we starve the beast and feed the pride. We reallocate those funds away from the white businesses and redirect them to the business organization, or institution of the week. We target one Afurakani, Afurakani business organization or institution per week for optimal capital infusion. So when one person takes $10 away from a white business and instead spends it with a black business, that business receives $10. When 1,000 people are focused on the same business of the week, then that's a $10,000 infusion of capital to a black business taken away from white businesses and placed right in the accounts of the black business, which allows them to hire from the community uh, full-time, immediately within the same week, permanently expand their products and services to us and serve us at a greater capacity. If we do not engage that process, then by default, we leave that $10,000 in the hands of the whites and their offspring, and by default, we are financing our enemies and financing our own oppression. So we are only intelligent when we starve the beast and feed the pride on a consistent basis and reroute those funds to black businesses, organizations, and institutions. That is part of our Ocom economic development model, but the philosophical foundation is key because people can talk about buying black, supporting black, and so forth, but largely they never do so. And that's because there's a mindset That's not holistic. Sloganeering is one thing, but action is another. If you do not transform your mindset rooted in your ancestral religious values, 10, 15, 20 years from now, people will still be talking about buy black and still talking about how we still have not rerouted our dollars back back to black businesses. We've been conditioned in self-hatred, and therefore we have no desire to spend and support our own businesses. This is why we continuously support our absolute enemies, the whites and their offspring, until you transform the mindset, even the pseudo so-called conscious and culturally aware people will continue to listen to cultural information and post things on Facebook and talk about buying black and so forth. But at the end of the day, when they spend money, they will be spending money with the whites and their offspring, allowing black businesses to go out of business while they're supporting the enemy while on social media talking about buy black. We have to transform the mindset, the adjuni, the mind. That's what the Okom economic development model focuses on first and foremost. And then once the mindset is transformed through ritual practice, then you can have an operation like starve the beast and feed the pride, and people automatically are down with that kind of operation because they have a repulsion 
for giving all of their money spiritually, just a repulsion for giving all of their money to the whites and their offspring. They have a natural attraction to support black businesses, and they have a repulsion to support the whites and their offspring. And we need to develop and uncover that natural repulsion we have to support our enemies and uncover that natural attraction we have to support our own. So this is what we deal with on Agua Marketplace. This is a special broadcast of Agua Marketplace because of our upcoming event. So we want to get into some, some of the cosmological foundational information regarding the Hapi Merit retreat and the nature of these deities, Hapi and Merit. So when you look on the information, informational piece for the broadcast, we say that Hapi and Merit are the male and female Abosom deities governing the inundation of the rivers on Asase earth as well as the rivers of blood in your physical body and the river channels of energy within your spirit body. So they are the male and female divinities, the Abosom, that govern our Hapi Merit retreat, our Hyber Nation retreat. When you go to our page on our website, the Hapi Merit page, you see images of Hapi and Merit. Of course, we have the video. And we'll, when you look at the page, you'll see we're talking about what the treat, retreat, retreat is. Um, we, we mentioned some of the cosmological information, but we're going to get into detail about that tonight. The annual retreat is, a, this is the first annual retreat. It's a training retreat for those who will become facilitators of Oberima and Obatai trainings in their communities. That's one part of it. It's a training, cultural, and ritual retreat. So Oberima is Afurakani manhood. Obatain is Afurakani womanhood. We published our book, Oberima Afurakani Manhood, which is a manual for Afurakani men. It's been out for a number of years. We've had tens of thousands of downloads with the free ebook version. That book has transformed the lives of Afurakani young men and adults. It's seven sections based on the seven days of the week and the Abosom, the divinities that govern the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that govern the seven days of the week. There's a principal value of manhood associated with each one of those deities and each one of the days of the week. So every day of the week you have a specific principal value that carries the energy of the abosom that governs the day for you to adhere to, to harmonize with, and so forth. It is a manual for manhood every single day. The same is true of the Obad Tain Afrai Kaidit Womanhood book, which we just released this past August, seven sections as well. The female divinities govern the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that govern the seven-day week. Seven principal values of Afrikaidi womanhood connected to these female divinities, forces in nature that animate the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that govern the seven-day week, and therefore it's a holistic approach to womanhood and so forth. So we have both of those books out. So the training portion of the retreat, we will have a workshop for the Oberima Afrikaidi manhood. I will be conducting that workshop with the men, and then we'll have the workshop for the women, Obatain, Ia, Adru, conduct the workshop. But then we will also have a joint workshop for the Pata Sasatim, which is an educational curriculum for Afurakani youth and adults, which is really like the precursor to Obediman Obatain. And then we'll also have another workshop as well. So that the training aspect are those workshops in the morning and early afternoon on Saturday and Sunday, Miminida and uh, Awusida. Then in the late afternoon and evening, people will be able to go out and um, tour the Gullah Islands and so forth and do whatever they would like to do. So the retreat is from February 16th through the 19th. People arrive on February 16th, which is a Friday. The actual sessions begin Saturday morning, and as we said, into, later into the day, and also Sunday and later into the day, people leave on Monday. So it's partially a vacation retreat to go to the ancestral lands, the Gullah Islands, where our ancestresses and ancestors wage war against the whites and their offspring and establish independent settlements there. That's part of that process. It's a sacred area for Afurakani, Afurakani people in North America. Um, but, it's, of course, we have that training piece but then the cultural piece, of course, and ritual, we engage in ritual as well. So we talk about that portion. 
um, on the first part of the page, and we talk about the time of Hapi and Merit, yeah, both some of the inundation. When you look at the astronomical zodiac, where the constellations, the constellations, when you look at the tropical and sidereal zodiac, you'll find that because of the precession of the equinoxes, which the White Nile Spring did not understand a couple thousand years ago, the dates regarding the tropical and sidereal zodiacs are about 89% inaccurate. There are also 13 constellations that cross the ecliptic now because of the precession of the equinoxes instead of 12. So therefore, there are 13 constellations that the sun, the Aten, moves through that cross the ecliptic. All of them are not 30 days each. Some of them are, one is 32 days, one's 25, one is only seven days, one is 45, and so forth. So they're, they're different. So when you look at the astronomical zodiac, it's the actual placement of the constellation and how long the Aten, the sun, is in the constellation. So when you look at that proper um, mapping, you'll see that the Aquarius constellation, the water bearer, which is actually Hapi, when he's holding the two vessels of water and filling up the river, he's the water bearer. This is where they got Aquarius being the water bearer from. It's actually Hapi as well as Merit. It actually begins on February 16th. And, of course, we're having our hibernation retreat February 16th through the 19th. We'll have vegan food, ritual, culture, and so forth. So all of that detailed information is there on the site. But we want to get into this cosmology. We talked about, we briefly talked about it uh, in a previous broadcast. We want to get into some more details with the nature of these deities and their titles and how they're related, as you see, Hapi, the male divinity, Merit, the female divinity. Um, you will see in English, you'll see that these terms are the origins of the terms happy and Mary, or married, Merit, and so forth. We want to get into that information. So okay. if you have any questions or comments in the chat room, you must Log in as a user. If you have any questions or comments on the phone line, uh, hit the number one so we can see that your hand is raised. All right, so first, what we're going to do, you can go back to the Happy Mary page on the ojirapo.com site. Now, there's a portion in the first paragraph that says the restoration of Apurakani manhood an Afuraikaidi womanhood rooted in our ancestral religious values is key to the restoration of Ojiraman, the purified nation, Afurakanu, Afuraikaidi Africans in the Western Hemisphere. This is a foundational element of Amanie, Afurakani, Afuraikaidi African Black nationism, the purification of nationalism. For grounded Afurakani, Afurakaiti, African black men and women form strong marriages, raise strong children, and build strong families. The cornerstone of the Afurakani, Afurakaiti nation, Oman. All Afurakanu, Afurakaiti Africans, black people must be grounded in these principles. So on one hand, it's a training retreat for those who will facilitate these workshops in the community or even just with their children and so forth to give these principles to their children or those who they work with. But it's also dealing with the nation Ojirama. Everyone within Ojirama and the purified nation of Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere must be rooted in proper notions of manhood and womanhood as defined by the Abosom, the divinities that govern us, our Patriclan and Matriclan Abosom, divinities that empower us and guide us and so forth. We have to have a proper notion of manhood and womanhood based on who we are, not just blood-wise, clan-wise, and just talking about being responsible and, you know, um, being protective and builders and so forth, but the values, what we value how we operate, how, the kind of decisions we make based on who we actually are spiritually, what is our spiritual constitution, what divinities govern us, 
how do we make decisions and so forth. That's what separates us from all other non Afurakani, non Afurakani people. We have a divine function individually, but also as a collective, as Ojirama the purified nation. This is why we have this notion of Amani nationism, the purification of nationalism, understanding what a nation is rooted in our ancestral religious values. Strong relationships are the foundation for strong marriages, which is the foundation for raising strong children, building strong families. When you have strong families and most families uh, coalesce with regard to clan structures, then that's the strong foundation of a nation. But it starts with the proper definition of manhood and womanhood. And when we have that, then we can deal with happy and merit, or happy and married, forming these strong bonds. So we need to have this, this is why we have this, we're going to have this ritual retreat on an annual basis. We just released the Obatine Afraikadi Womanhood book back in August. So this is the first time now that we have both books, the Manhood book and the Womanhood book out. Now that we have both of them out, now we can have these workshops and fully ground all of our people in these principles. So let's get to this notion of Hapi and Merit, these divinities, what their names mean, how they're related to being happy, Hapi, and married, Merit, and so forth. So first we're going to talk about Hapi. And if you look at the definition, just a basic definition of the name of the divinity, First, of course, this is spirit force, and you have, and we'll get into this, the dual divinities, Hapi of the South and Hapi of the North. Hapi Reset, Hapi of the South, Hapi Met, Hapi of the North. The same thing with Merit of the South, Merit Shema, Merit Met, Merit of the North. But the basic name, Hap, Hap, of course, means to come forward, to move forward, to advance. It also means to hug, to embrace. To, to move, but it also means to regulate, to bind. It can also, therefore, means establisher of laws, laws laid down by the learned scientific laws and so forth, to bind, to regulate. So to come forward, to advance, to hug, to embrace, to bind, to regulate. When Hapi is moving forward, the inundation of the river, when the river overflows its banks and so forth and overruns the banks and floods the land and so forth, eventually the water is going to recede, and then the land will be fertile. Black silt has been deposited on the banks of the river, and people can go out in ancient Kemet, and this is how we will plant our crops on that fertile black soil after the waters recede, after they have distributed that black soil, that fertile black soil, and then people can have crops, you know, when it's time for the harvest. But Hapi advancing, moving forward, expanding, the inundation of the river swelling and so forth, hugging, embracing the land, flooding the land and so forth, fusing with the land and so forth, binding and regulating, establishing law and so forth, establishing uh, an order. It very rarely rained in ancient Kemet, so the people were dependent on the flood of the river to bring that fertile black soil to deposit on the banks of the river so that they could plant their crops and so forth. So that regulation, movement of the river, every year around the same time, the regularity of that flooding uh, would, would announce to the people what's going to take place at the harvest time. At the same time, we're going to look quickly at the term Merit, the female divinity. You have Merit of the south and Merit of the north, twin divinities. Uh, the wives happy to set, happy of the south, and happy met, happy of the north. So, mer or merit, on one hand, can mean a collection of water. That's one part of it. The water on the river bank and so forth. Um, you also have to bind, to to tie, to bind. If you look at the the little uh, sickle or the quote unquote hoe the, you know, agricultural tool that's used to represent the term mer or meri, that's a tool that's binding the person when they're plowing, binding them to the earth, tying to the, them to the earth, binding to earth and so forth. It's binding, we talked about hapi, embracing, hugging the earth and also binding, 
binding laws and regulations and so forth. Of course, marriage has to do with a binding, and it's also dealing with regulation. Merit means to bind, to tie, to bound, and so forth. Now, you also have the term mer with regard to those who are deceased. Mer, plural, meru, those who have died, the deceased. You also have the living, quote-unquote, dead, those who are bound, those who are servants, vassals, and so forth. If they're bound to service, bound to an individual, forced to work for them and so forth, you can be bound in that fashion. You can be bound in a negative fashion. You can also be bound when you look at someone who's deceased, when the spirit separates from the body, then the body itself is bound or tied or fastened into the grave in the funerary process. This is why in ancient Kemet, the word for um, ships arriving in port is mer or merit, and the word for someone who uh, transitioned or died is also mer, merit. The person there will say that the person has arrived in port. That means the ships, if they're out in the water, and then they sail in and they arrive in their port or their little quote-unquote parking space near the bank of the river, then they've reached the end of their destination. Once the boat has reached its destination, then the inhabitants of the boat disembark from the vessel. They leave the vessel. But you don't want to just leave the boat empty sitting in the water because if you leave the boat empty and just sitting in the water and you go home and go to sleep and get up the next day, the water current can cause the boat, pull the boat out into the water, make it crash into other boats or crash into rocks or whatever it is. So when the boat arrives in port, reaches its final destination, the people leave the boat, disembark from the vessel. The vessel is now empty, and then the boat is bound, mer, meri, those boats or ships that are bound, or quote-unquote mer becomes the English term moor or bound. That empty vessel is bound, tied to a mooring post, a medic post, and now it can stay in the same place. If you want to come back later and get back inside of that vessel and utilize it, you know it's going to be there. If you don't bind it or tie it, the empty vessel, then it will, can be destroyed. The same thing happens with the physical body. This is why the, the boats are called mer and meri, those who have arrived in port, reach their final destination and are bound to a post. When we make our transition, the sun sets on our life. Our body, the spirit separates from the body. The body then, through a funerary process, is bound or fastened into the grave or into the port so that wild animals don't come and take the body and drag it all across the land and rip it and tear it apart and so forth. The body is bound and the spirit, the inhabitant of the vessel, the body disembarks from that vessel, the spirit leaves the body. But the body is bound or fastened, and we have a ritual process, mummification, where we bind the body up. We embalm the body. We preserve the body. We talked about this in the previous broadcast on mummification because for us, instead of cremating or just throwing the body out like the whites and all spring would do, we would preserve the body because that body, when it's preserved, it becomes crystallized. We literally crystallize the body, turn it into a large crystal, and therefore becomes a talisman, a shrine for the spirit of the ancestor or ancestors who used to inhabit the body. It's the most magnetic, powerful shrine imaginable, ancestral shrine imaginable. So when we go to the place of burial during times of communal ancestral ritual or individual ancestral ritual and poor libation and give offering, we activate that ancestral shrine and it becomes a magnifier of the energy of that ancestor or ancestress and then their spirit is drawn back to that space. They communicate directly with us through spirit possession, spirit communication and so forth during ritual so we can learn from them and be guided by them or become healed by them. And then once ritual is over, then they go back to the ancestral realm. But that body is a shrine, so we preserve the body. We crystallize the body. We utilize it, and, of course, these bodies have been dug up thousands of years later, still preserved, utilized as ancestral shrines. So just like the physical vessel is a mer, mer it has died, it has arrived in port, reached its final destination, and bound, and the, the um, inhabitants disembark from the vessel. 
The person is called one who has arrived in port. That is a euphemism of, for death in ancient Kemet. He has arrived in port, meaning he has died. His body has arrived in port. The spirit has disembarked from the vessel of the ship, the body. And now we're going to bind the body, and the body is going to become a mer, a meri, um, a deceased entity. It's going to be bound or fastened like a mooring post, bound, and so forth, and it's going to be utilized for ancestor ritual. And the deceased are therefore called mer, plural, meru. But in a negative fashion, if you happen to be bound to your lot in life, say you were someone who invaded, you know, a territory, you got caught up by the military, you became a prisoner of war and so forth, and you're bound and you have to follow orders and you're a servant and you're afflicted and so forth, you're bound, you're a living mayor or so-called moor. And, of course, in our book, Moor Means Dead, we go into detail about that, showing that the term moor not only means the physically dead, the ones who are bound, the bodies who have been bound and the spirit left the vessel, they're the deceased, uh, but also the socially dead, the slave, the vassal, the one who is afflicted, including someone who is afflicted by disease. Therefore, they're bound and bound up, and they can't operate and move you know, freely in the manner that they want to. So you have a, a, a normal context of death. Death is part of life. Life operates in the physical world. You live in the physical world. You go through the gate of death, and you live in the spirit realm. You go through the gate of birth, and you live in the physical world. So birth and death are the gates, but life is continuous from the spirit realm to the physical realm and back. That's a normal process when you go through that process of going through the gateway of death. At the right time, you become meru or the deceased. But outside of that natural process, if you engage in self-destructive activity and you become meru or living dead, like you become bound to drug use, drug addiction, now you're bound to that. That's not a good binding. You become a living dead person or you're socially dead. You become a slave and so forth, slave to addiction, slave to food, slave to lust, slave to these different things. This is where this notion of being a mayor later more comes from. And, of course, the whites in our spring utilize that derogatory term that we use for a certain class of people who are in a negative dead mental state. They use that to uh, call all of us more. And, of course, these idiots today are walking around calling themselves more because of their stupidity. So, of course, we destroyed their entire doctrine with our book, More Means Dead, which is irrefutable, period. So, but this notion of meri, meaning binding in a natural sense, that includes the river waters being bound and includes the cultivation of the land. When you use that cultivation, that plowing, that, that, that hole, that plowing hole and so forth, yourself to the land so you can engage in the cultivation process, but that cultivation process with the mare, with the quote-unquote hoe or the plow, even that is related to burial. You can't cultivate mare without engaging the burial process. When people think about cultivation of the land so you can have crops that spring up, it's a burial process. It still has to do with death, but then later resurrection. When you take a plow and you plow the land and you make a split in the land, a split in the soil and so forth, and then you take the seed that is inactive, you take that inactive inert seed, you don't just plant it. Yes, you place it in the soil, but then you cover the seed up. That is a barrier. That's mare, a barrier. Then later on, because of what takes place, of course, there's germination and rooting and then sprouting, and then later there's a resurrection of what was in the seed. That's like Osar dying and then resurrecting and so forth, the black one and the green one. So, but still, when you start dealing with cultivation, you're dealing with binding yourself through the plow to the earth, pulling up the earth and so, so forth, overturning the earth and so forth, planting the seed, and you're dealing with burial. So when you look at the term mer, merit, the female divinity, mer, merit, a collection of water, but it also means to bind, to fasten, and so forth. Meri, meaning to fasten, also has to do with that binding in a contractual way with, and spiritually with regard to marriage. Hop, hapi, meaning binding, regulation, hugging, embracing, embracing the channels the, that the river moves through and so forth, and it causes that whole process. If you look in the physical body, it pulls all of these notions together. In fact, let me just give a few more definitions of mare, and then we're going to look in the physical body and see 
exactly how it pulls all of these notions together, and then you have a better understanding of the cosmology. Anytime you want to learn about the culture of cosmology, you can see the shrines within the body that the deities operate through, and then you have a better, better understanding of how they're operating. So, for example, mer, we said, means a collection of water. It collects in a certain way. It pulls or collects. That's important. Mer also means to tie, to bind up, to tie together, to bind on a crown, to fetter, to be fettered, a band, a bandage, a girdle, a fillet, and then, of course, the collection of water and also... Um, but mer also means desire. As in, quote, unquote, love, they'll talk about love or desire. I'm talking about that force of desire, that magnetism. You can desire things that are natural, and you're drawn to them, mer, drawn to them. But then you can also have a misguided desire, a misguided attraction, an artificial attraction, for example, an addiction. And then that attraction becomes a binding or an enslavement a draw, a magnetism towards something that's actually destroying you. So your desire can be corrupted or you can have a natural desire. If you're outside and it's 100 degrees and you're sweating, you have a natural desire for water to replenish yourself. That's a natural attraction, a natural mad or draw desire or magnetism. If you have desire for crack cocaine, that's a manufactured, unnatural, artificial pseudo-desire that's been imposed upon you by chemicals that manufactured by the whites and offspring and distributed in our community, you develop that pseudo-attraction, that pseudo-desire, and if you follow it and embrace it, it's going to actually destroy you. But, so we talk about mare, collection of water. Mare means tied to bind and so forth. To cultivate, but it also has to do with burial. Burial being the end of something, but it could lead to resurrection and so forth. So let's look in the body. We talked about Hapi and Merit governing the inundation of the river in Kemet, they're twin divinities. When you look in the body, the dual rivers in the body are the arteries and the veins. If you look at the arteries and the veins, you're looking at Hapi and Merit. Now, what's the difference between the arteries and the veins? The arteries carry blood away from the heart to the tissues of the body. They are usually positioned deeper within the body, are more muscular than the veins, which helps in transporting blood that is full of oxygen efficiently to the tissues. So the artery and the arteries are red. So they carry blood away from the heart to the tissues of the body. They're more muscular. They send, you know, um, the oxygenated blood, the blood that's full of fire, oxygenated. They send that blood all the way throughout the body. And they're more muscular and so forth. When we said hot means to come forth, Hop means to come forth and manifest. Hop governs the arteries. Hop P, the male divinity, governs the arteries, the more muscular one, sending the blood, the oxygenated blood, pumping it all throughout the body. And, and, you know, sending it to the organs and cells and everything else. Then you have the veins. And the veins are blue. The veins carry blood from the tissues of the body back to the heart are usually positioned closer beneath the surface of the skin, are less muscular than arteries but contain valves to keep blood flowing in the right direction, usually toward the heart. So one is sending the blood into, you know, uh, the artery sending the blood throughout the body. Hop means to come forth. It's also binding and regulating and so forth. Hugging, you know, sending that blood and it's hugging the cells and organs and everything else. Then you have Merit capturing that blood that's deoxygenated, and then she carries it back to the heart. The deoxygenated blood is carried back to the heart. Mer, Merit, the one who dies, but there's a potential for resurrection. Mer, meaning collection of water, a collection of the blood that's deoxygenated. When you arrived in port, you become Mer, Merit, you've reached your final destination. She carries the deoxygenated blood, the blood that's losing its vitality. She carries it back to the heart. It's reached its final destination into the right side of the heart, that right atrium of the heart and so forth, um, which it arrives. And then, of course, once it goes through the heart, it becomes oxygenated because it's sent through the, the lungs. The lungs 
breathe that air into it, the oxygen into the blood, it's oxygenated, full of vitality, then it's sent through the left atrium um, of the heart into the left ventricle, and then it's sent out from the left ventricle throughout the body, that circulatory system. That is directly related, just as a side note, to the positioning with regard to the maps in ancient Kemet. Very often people will say, well, in ancient Kemet, south is on top, north is on bottom, the whites and their offspring flip the maps around to make Europe north be on top, and then, you know, Apuraka, Apuraka, Africa being on the bottom because they, that's a political move. If you have a circle, what is up and what is down, they decided to flip it around to make Europe appear to be on top because they wanted north on top because that's where they um, manifested in the intestinal region of the body and so forth. They wanted to make north the top to make it appear to be superior. But in our culture, south is the top, the front land, foremost land, headland, res, resi means head, resh means head. You'll see the actual hieroglyph or medu of the head of a person that is the res or the south the front, the foremost, the top, and so forth, and then north is at the bottom. If you have south at the top, then when you point or you're facing south, that's the front. If you're facing south in the front, then when you point to the right, you're also pointing to the west. If you're pointing to the left, then you're pointing to the east. Now, the word for right, I meant in ancient Kemet, it turns out that the word for right, I meant, is also the word for west. Now, the word for left, optet, is also the word for east. The only way east can also be left is if you're facing south. The only way uh, west can also be right is if you're facing south. So we have that cosmology, and, we, of course, we have those definitions which prove that but we have it even in a greater degree in the physical body because as we just sh would show, and when you look at anatomy, you will see the deoxygenated blood, the blood that has lost its vitality, captured by Merit in her shrine, and she carries it from the organs and tissues to become regenerated. She carries it to the right side of the heart, the right atrium and so forth, that's where the deoxygenated blood, that's the right, the ament side of the heart, the western side of the heart. The sun sets in the west. That's the end of the life. It's beginning to lose its power. It goes into the quote-unquote underworld, and it rises in the optet, the east, when it's full of vitality once again and rises up into the sky. The sun sets in the west in the ament in the, on the right side, the ament side, the right side. The deoxygenated blood that's losing its vitality, it enters into the heart in the right side, the right atrium and so forth, goes to the right ventricle into the lung section. Then it gets um, oxygenated, full of vit vitality and life and so forth, that divine living energy, the bond by it, of the creator and creatress, Ra and Raya. And then it goes from the lungs through the left atrium into the left ventricle in the octet, the eastern side of the heart, the left side, the octet side, the eastern side, and then it goes out into the body, fully oxygenated, fully fired up, fully radiant, and so forth. It leaves through the, west, the eastern side of the body, which is the sunrise, the east, the octet, the left, and it sets in the west, the right, the ament, the deoxygenated blood. This is why medi, mer means arriving in port, dying, reaching your end of your destination, but then you go through a process and you have the capacity to resurrect. When the seed is buried, many cultivation, but the seed is buried, it's covered over, but then it has the potential to resurrect. So this is what we're talking about. So that blood is sent out by hot. He comes forth hot to come forth, binding, embracing the land, regulating as he's moving along, you know, flooding the land with nutrients and so forth, flooding the organs and tissues with nutrients after he has come forth from the left side of the heart, the eastern side of the heart, the vibrant side of the heart, and so forth, with that vitality and so forth, hugging, hop, regulating, hop, coming forth, hop, moving through. Once the cells receive that energy, of course, they are enlivened. They become full of the energy of hop or hapi, 
so the cells become happy or quote unquote happy, full of life and so forth. And once they're full of that energy and they're fully, you know, saturated, that mer, meaning a collection of water, a collection in a certain area, a pooling of water, all of that is collected. Mer, they engage in merriment or merriness or merry happiness and so forth and utilize everything that they just received. And once they utilize it, you can, you know, if you become quote unquote rich and you have a great deal of resources. Then you go out and you buy a bunch of things and you distribute it to everyone who, who is connected to you. And everybody receives the nutrients of, or the bounty of quote unquote happy and they become happy or quote unquote happy happiness because they're regulated and bound and, and full of, you know, nutrients and nourishment. Then they consume, they engage in merriment or happiness of merit. They consume all of that that they've just been, that they've just been given and that they receive, the abundance. Once they exhaust that abundance that they received, now they carry what is left over to the place the right side, the land of the setting sun, the right side of the heart, the deox deoxygenated piece, so it can be revived or revitalized, so it can be recycled and given to the cells once again. So you go from happy, happiness, merriment, and then you start that cycle all over again. There's a death, there's a resurrection, there's a death, a burial, a resurrection, a rejuvenation, a renewal, and a restart. It's the same thing with regard to our people. And when you look at, for example, Hopi of the North and Hopi of the South, when you look at the arteries, um, the superior vena, or the superior veins and the inferior veins, the arteries and um, veins coming out of the top of the heart going to the upper extremities, then the arteries and veins going to the, from, from the bottom of the heart going to the lower extremities and so forth, you're looking at Hopi and Merit, Hapi Met, Hapi of the North, and Meri Met, Meri of the North. Then you also have, of course, Hapi Reset, Hapi of the South, and Meri Shema, which is also Meri Reset, Meri of the South. So the um, veins and arteries coming out of the upper portion of the heart and the upper extremities, the veins coming out of the bottom portion of the heart, the bottom extremities, you have those twin divinities. This is why they're shown as twins. They are two twin divinities on both sides, and they are, quote, unquote, married or bound together. So when you have that flow of energy that's nourishing the cells in the body, when you look at the body of the Oman, the body of the community, the body of Ujiraman, the purified nation, we have to invoke Hapi and invoke Meri, Hapi Reset, Hapi Met, Meri Chema, Meri Met, so that we can unlock that flow of energy within us. Just like you have, if, you're, if your body is, you know, in good health and your uh, arteries are clear and so forth, then you have a free flow of blood. If your arteries are clogged up because you've been consuming a great deal of, you know, uh, food with a lot of fats and everything else, then you have high blood pressure and it causes problems all throughout your body. So we have to clean out those veins so there's a free flow of blood, a free flow of nutrients, so that the health of the body is sustained. In the same fashion, if there's a free flow within your energetic body, those channels, those river channels of energy within your energetic body governed by Hapi and Merit, through ritual practice, if you're engaged in self-destructive behavior, lust and malice and things like that, then your immunity is lowered and parasites can enter, just like when your immunity is lowered here and parasites can enter. If your immunity is lower, parasites can enter to your system, attach themselves to you, clog up the veins of your and arteries of your energetic body, and therefore you have problems. There are blockages in life, blockages in relationships, blockages in finances, blockages in, uh, in uh, career, blockages in all aspects of life, nation building, whatever it is. But when you engage the ritual process, that's why we say ojida, purification, operationalizes not its own. Purification operationalizes ancestral religion. When you engage the ojida or purification process, then you purify those energetic channels through ritual, whether it's ritual song, ritual dance, ritual prayer, ritual 
invocation through meditation and other activities and so forth, you purify those channels, you clean out, you know, your blood vessels, you cleanse your blood and so forth, physically but also spiritually, receiving the energy of the abosome that govern you, that govern your head as well as your patriclan and matriclan abosome, and that energy burns through those parasitical entities which are in your energetic body. So there's a free flow of energy and so forth. Then you can clear the way, and then you can receive the abundance of hapi. You can become, quote, unquote, hapi, and that binding takes place, and then you can engage in merit or merriment. You can fully utilize the abundance that's been re released by hapi, and there's a marriage between hapi and merit at that point. The release of that abundance and the utilization of that abundance is just like the release of the sperm cell, the penetration of the ovum, and then the ovum collapses around the sperm cell and takes what's within the sperm, sperm cell and begins that division, that mitosis, and utilizes what's within the sperm cell as well as what's in the ovum. So the union of the sperm and ovum is similar to the union of Hapi and Meri. Once his Hapi is released and he comes forth, releases that bounty, that abundance, Meri takes that bounty or abundance and distributes it and we utilize it and exhaust it, and then there's a renewal and so forth. So this is the connection physiologically with these two divinities within the physical body, the same thing in the energetic body, but then the same thing in the communal body. When we engage the ritual process as a community, engage in communal ritual, of course we have an individual ritual as well in our homes, individual with regard to our own meditation and so forth, and then family connecting at the ancestral shrine ritually and the shrines of the Abosom connected to the family and so forth, but then you come out with a communal ritual to purify the entire community. If there is crime or disorder or dysfunction within the community, relationships within the community, misunderstandings within the community, you engage in communal ritual, whether it's divination, ritual song, ritual dance, libation, group meditation, these various different things to begin to purify the channels within the communal body. When you purify those channels within the communi communal body, then the binding or marriage or union can take place. We can benefit from all the work that people are doing in the community, everything that's being brought forth, happy, all the abundance being brought forth by the energy that we invest in nation building and so forth. We can receive that and then we can exhaust it through merit. We can utilize it, do something with it positive, and then we can regenerate it. Once there's a deoxygenation, deoxygen, once there's an exhaustion of the resources and the work that we've done, then we can regenerate, reoxygenize, and release that energy once again and utilize it for the nation building process. It begins generation, the Afurakani male and the Afurakani female. The transformation, uh, the transformation from female to obatine, afrikaitni, women, and so forth. When we restore from a pure foundation of afrikaitni manhood, afrikaitni womanhood, that includes that free flowing of energy. You must engage the ritual process individually. You learn these different principles. It's one thing to learn the principles that are found in the book and so forth. But to activate them, you have to engage the ritual process. To bring order to your life, you have to invoke the divinities that regulate order and creation and bring that order into your life. So you have to engage the ritual process that is inclusive of invoking the divinity hapi, as said, as well as hapi met, invoking the divinity merit shema, as well as merit met, to facilitate that free flow of energy, not only within your physical body, but in your spirit body so that you can receive what you need to receive, utilize what you have received in a harmonious fashion, and then renew or recycle that energy, reoxygenate, rebrand, re revitalize, and start that process all over again. When we do that and align ourselves with Hapi, ourselves with Merit, then the binding function of Hapi, the binding function of Merit is activated. Then we can engage in harmonious marriages. And of course, marry and marrying comes from the term merit and so forth, and people become happily married, a happy merit and so forth. This is where that terminology comes from. Of course, we're going to get into all of that in detail 
at the retreat, but we wanted to give that cosmological breakdown of these deities, which when you look in um, books dealing with Egyptology and so forth, they'll talk about Hapi, they'll talk about him being the one who brings abundance and so forth and all these different things, or Mary dealing with merriment and singing and, and songs and ritual and so forth, and her carrying the abundance of Hapi in her, you know, in her vessel, in her basket and so forth, um, and also talking about the river, but they can't give you the fullness of who these deities really are, how they manifest physiologically in the body, how they manifest in the spirit body, how they're connected to us with regard to nation building and so forth. That only comes from ritual practice actually invoking these abosom. And they exist in all the various traditions. They exist in the Yoruba tradition, Akan tradition, Bakongo tradition. Everybody has a name for these forces in creation. They are major divinities, just like the arteries and veins within your body, the shrines of Hapi and Meri are major, and, and your body depends on that circulatory system. They are major divinities within creation. Of course, the heavenly Nile, for example, is Hop or order, the great Hop, the river of stars in the sky and so forth, the river, the river on the earth, the river in your body, the veins and the arteries, and of course, the river of energy going from the spine to the top of the head and back down the front. All of these manifestations of the, you know, shrines of these divinities within the body, on earth, in the stellar region, and so forth, in the spirit realm. So we can only get that kind of information from engaging the ritual practice, invoking these divinities by name at the shrines, dealing directly with them, and then, of course, they will feed us that information, how they operate, how they function, how they show up in different traditions. And then when you look back at what our ancestresses and ancestors laid out in the text, of course it confirms everything that they show us ritually. Of course the names and the descriptive titles associated with the names and the definitions and so forth are directly reflective of the functioning of the deity in real time in creation. But all those different definitions, the whites and the offspring cannot fuse together in a cosmological definition because they don't understand. They just think they're separate definitions where hot means to regulate or to bind or regulate, but then hop also means to come forward, and hop also means, you know, river and inundation. They can't see the connection between all of those things. They can't, can't see the connection between merit, meaning death, merit, meaning ships arriving in port, merit, meaning the dead, and so forth, meru, plural, meaning the dead, mer, meaning to bind or fasten, mer, meaning a slave vassal, mer, also meaning cultivation, mer, also meaning merriment. How can something deal with merriment? also have to do with death. They don't understand the connection between those things. But cosmologically, they're all pulled together when you understand the cosmology, but the cosmology can only be understood through ritual practice and dealing directly with these divinities. That's the key to all of this information. Then the definitions, that the cosmology is born of the actual functioning of the deities. We didn't draw up the cosmology first and then deal with the deities second. As the Abosom, the Avodu, the Orisha move and operate through creation and affect us, and we learn how they affect us, and we recognize and, and catalog the results of our interaction with them, then that is the birth of quote unquote cosmology, which is simply us conveying what's actually happening and how the divinities operate. So you learn cosmology through engaging the actual divinities, the ritual, the deities through ritual process, and then you have an understanding. Okay, so uh, hold on one second. Um, so if you have a question or a comment on the phone line, hit the number one. If you have a question or a comment on the chat room, um, you have to log in as a user in order to interact in the chat room. If you don't have a username, you can sign up for one very quickly in Blog Talk. Okay, we're going to look on, um, on the phone line. We have a question on the phone line, uh, number 0217. You got a question or a comment? Yes. Um, good night, Brother Quasi. Um, What's up? I noticed that in um, this your broadcast tonight, um, you were mentioning that, um, as usual, a lot of the cosmic, cosmology of the European states is things of uh, from African cosmology, 
And what I want to know is um, uh, this month uh, coincides with the um, the Asian New Year, and usually I notice that um, one of their major symbols is like that red dragon with a lot of um, lots of gold decoration. Where do they get that from? Like, what part of African cosmology is it taken from? Um, so their New Year, let me see. I think their New Year begins on. Let me look at the date real quick. I think this year. Let me see. I just want to check real quick. Okay, so yeah, it, it goes around. For them, this year it is uh, February sixteenth. Oh, okay. So. Okay. And and it I happens it around that same time. Yeah, they right. have they have their uh, they have their you know it shifts a little bit with regard to the year, but it's around okay. that same time. But it's it's still you know it goes their calendar. They they never had their own calendar, so okay. they're imitating you know what they established from our people around this. It's two things that are happening at this particular time because of the procession of the equinox. Things have shifted. So, yes, Hapi, this is a time of, quote, unquote, the water bearer, Hapi and so forth, um, starting. And it starts actually this year on February 16th, and theirs is connected with that. But there's also something else happening around that time, which is around the beginning of February. So this, this specific cycle within that February period is what the Whites in Our Spring will call Groundhog's Day. So... Um, yeah, that's right. So if you look at the right, so you look at the four points of the year. You have the equinoxes, which are the balancing points, twelve hours of darkness, twelve hours of sunlight around that time, balancing points points of the year. It's akin to, you know, sunrise and sunset during the day. Like the spring is like the sunrise and you know, fall, the fall equinox is like the sunset, the evening point and so forth. But then the solstices, the hottest day of the year is, you know, the summer solstice around June 20, 21st, and the shortest day of the year, the coldest day of the year is, you know, December 20th, 21st, which is the winter solstice. Um, but in between those four points, you have those mid points within the year, the halfway through that cycle. So for us, for our calendar, you know, we have four cycles of uh, 13 weeks, so four cycles of 91 days for each one of these seasons, and then that's 364 days, and then the 365th day is the day of the equinox for us, and that is our New Year's Day, which is either September 22nd or September 23rd. That's how we calculate that. But those midpoints, um, you know, between the 91st day, 40-some days within, those midpoints, um, like in our Khan calendar, every 42 days you have an ancestral celebration, uh, 42-day cycle is the Adadria 9, the, you know, that cycle. Um, that's, the, that's like a midpoint between, you know, the solstice and the equinox. It's a balancing point between those two phases of the year. If you look at those different points, we always recognize, you know, the shift in energy between those midpoints of, the, of those solstice and equinox cycles. The White Snail Spring has removed, you know, the traditional observances, in our con culture we still have those every 42 days or whatever, they remove the traditional observances and then they replace them um, with something else, with some little nonsensical holiday. So, for example, if you look at, um, for example, uh, September. If you look at September, that's the equinox, then you get to the, the winter solstice 13 weeks later, that's December 21st, but the midpoint is around November 1st, October 31st, November 1st, November 2nd. And, of course, if you look at that midpoint, the White Snow Spring have placed a little pseudo-holiday. They have All Hallows' Eve, which is October 31st, and then All Souls' Day is November 1st or November 2nd in the Catholic Church or the, you know, depending on the version of Catholicism people are using. They've replaced the traditional observance a midpoint between an equinox and a solstice with a little holiday. If you look between um, December 21st and March 20th, which is the solstice and the next equinox, the balancing point, you find the midpoint 
is around that balancing point is the semi balancing point is is uh, around February first to second. Instead of acknowledging that ritual point, they have Groundhog Day right there. And they're like, you can mm-hmm. tell if the groundhog comes forward, if it, how many more days of winter it's going to be. How many more days of spring. If you look at the, right, if you look at the midpoint between March 21st and June 21st, um, that midpoint is around May 1st. And uh, in Canada, Canada, it still calls the celebration of the Maypole. In the United States, it's called May Day or whatever. But the maypoles, the fertility ritual, and so forth, with the white snarl spring becomes something degenerate with this sexuality. But it was a fertility ritual with the mid, you know, the uh, equinox going towards the summer solstice. So those midpoints in between, that they've replaced the observances with little holidays. And the same thing with the Chinese New Year's around that time of between the, you know, the um, quote unquote Groundhog's Day and the beginning of Hapi which is the water barrier. That's where they have that placed in that area. Okay. So then where did they get, like, the the red dragon specifically? Because you see it quite a lot in their um, celebrations and things like that. I mean, I see in, like, um, there are certain clans, African clans, that have, um, like, a red a snake as a totem, and um, there's a particular taboo that if they kill a red snake, that a family member um, may die. But um, it's I haven't been so far been able to find anything similar to the um, you know the dragons they you know they parade in the street with. Right. So when when they're dealing with dragons or you know whatever kind of reptile that they're dealing with. Originally, there are different deities associated, dealing with really serpents, um, like the sacred serpent of Ra and Wachet, mm-hmm. but then you also have Apep, which is a serpent as well. And so they're combining different things. When they have the negative dragon or the negative serpent and so forth, that's a corruption of Apep and his functioning in creation. We talked about that before with Apep operating through the intestines and so forth. So he has a specific role within the body and a specific role within creation. So when they're talking about these negative dragons, they're talking about a corruption by pep. When they're talking about the positive, you know, dragons or reptiles, they just transformed, you know, in certain respects, the sacred cobras or sacred pythons into dragons. Sometimes they'll, you know, transform sacred animals like Sobek, you know, the sacred co- crocodile divinity who mm-hmm. carries the, you know, body of Osara to the, you know, um, dry land and carries the hands of Heru to the dry land and so forth. He's, you know, um, one who preserves, helps to preserve the the continuity of the uh, empire through, quote, unquote, saving the body of Osara in the hands of Heru and so forth. They'll mm-hmm. transform that into a dragon as opposed to that sacred crocodile. So, depending on what they're using the dragons for, it's just a corruption of those things. But nothing they came up with on their own is always a corruption of something that had been done prior to Chinese people. Of course, when we look at the Shang dynasty in ancient China and the Fu Hsi dynasty in ancient China, those were Afurakani, Afurakani people who laid the foundation for civilization. And then the um, Chao and the Han quote unquote Asian ethnic groups came in later and took over. And of course they learned those basic fundamental um uh aspects of civilization from our from people and just continue to mm-hmm. perpetuate that. But then they of course they're gonna corrupt it because they have no capacity to really do what we're doing. Oh. Oh, that answers my question. Just one other quick question. Um you covered uh, several times the um, the concept of um, reincarnation and Vedra. Would it be accurate to say that um, Africans uh, that experience, I mean, what would be the actual age? I mean, I know what the earthly age would be, um, you know, when you're having a particular you know, like when you're alive and earth at a particular time, but would it be accurate to say that the spirit is actually hundreds to thousands of years old? 
Look, look, I, could you say that last portion again? Would it be accurate? Because Africans um, experience uh, reincarnation, would it be accurate to say that their actual spirit is hundreds to thousands of years old? Right. So, and, you know, the time continuum is different in the spirit realm. So, of course, our bodies wouldn't last that long. But the spirit is, you know, we've been here for multiple right. years. Of course, it's different in the spirit realm. But, you know, we won't experience age in the same way in the spirit realm. But, yes, we've been here for thousands of years. Like none of us reincarnating here in the Western Hemisphere are, you know, we're not reincarnating for the first time or coming, you know, incarnating for the first time. We've been here in the past. Yes, that's true. Because a lot of times, I mean, just in passing, a lot of times people, even when they don't um, participate in ancestral um, religion, they'll say, you know, like if you meet, especially like a young child that's like extremely mature, you know, even when they're like five and they act like they're 25, we'd say, you know, oh, this one has been here before, (laughs) you know. Right. So, um, yeah. So I was just, you know, when I thought of the concept of uh, reincarnation, I said, well, I mean, regardless of what your earthly age might be, the spirit is not necessarily um, the earthly age. It's been here before, so it's quite possible that it could be hundreds to thousands of years old. Exactly. Definitely. Thank you for answering my question. Um, okay, and yeah, I said it. We appreciate the call. Okay, so um, okay, so we just want to make sure we did not miss anything on the phone line. All right, so I'm gonna just check in the chat room real quick. So. Um, if anybody else has any questions, you can hit the number one. But we want to go back to one thing that we wanted to share with regard to the information that you see on the page, on, on the uh, Hoppy Metairie page. So the retreat, of course, is Feb- uh, February 16th through the 19th. We do still have, a because of cancellations, as we said before, a few couple of cancellations, um, we have a couple of spaces left if you would like to attend the retreat. On February 16th, um, you can go to the Hoppy Metairie page. We have some space left for late registration. You can go to the page now. You'll see all of the details there. You can make the payment there on the page. Um, if you have any questions, of course, send us an email. Let us know what's going on. Um, this, uh, once again, is the first retreat. This is the first training, cultural and ritual retreat. This is going to be an annual piece, nation building. Afuraikani manhood, Afuraikani womanhood. You'll see the details with regard to uh, the scheduling and so forth and the itinerary. We're going to post, we posted a basic itinerary on the page. Of course, we'll have a few more details, you know, in the coming couple of weeks, but we only have basically four weeks left. So, yet I'll say for those who have already supported the work, also, we talked about this last night. We are working to complete our film, the documentary film, Amaru Kapo Adebisa Ajumadi, African American Ancestral Religion or Ancestral Divination Project. That is going to be coming forward. We've had our crowdfunding effort for the past, since last January, we're at about 49% now because a couple of people made some contributions over the past couple of days. Yet I say we thank you for that. We've had about 97 or so people contribute over the past 12 months. That got us to 49%. So for those of you who like to support the work, if you support the work we've been doing, we would like to get to that 100% as soon as possible. As soon as we get to the 100%, we can complete the film as far as the filming piece within the next 30 days. So for those who support the work, starve the beast and feed the prize, support this effort so that we can get things done, we can complete the film before the equinox before the spring equinox, which would be ideal. So all we need is the support of even just the people listening who tune into the broadcast. There are enough people, um, you know, on the list to actually get us to that 100%. 
immediately. Uh, we have another phone call on the phone line. Uh, each y'all on the phone line, number 6482. You had a question or a comment? Chair on the phone line, number two. Oh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. In keeping with the theme of the Google Marketplace, I was wondering, well, I was thinking about it while you were talking, and I know a lot of people, our own people, we do support black business, but it seems to be like um, sort of like a theme. Like, uh, I don't want to say a fetish, but it's like a big deal. Like, it's not, it's like you said, it's not a natural, and you know, we're not naturally inclined to do it. Like, when we need socks, we don't think, okay, who's a black person itself? You know, that's not our natural inclinement so far. But I also noticed that when we're together as a group, that is, you know, what we do. We think about supporting our own first, but we're so spaced out. And um, at first I was wondering if it would be better for more of us to try to live around each other. I know we have, you know, Atlanta, Hotlanta, the the black place, and then we have certain places like Chocolate City, D.C. Um, For my own way of thinking, I've tried to avoid areas that are quote unquote black cities um, for the same reason I avoid Walmart at certain times because I don't want to be caught up in something. I know they can target big groups of us when they know where we are and they know our movements but um, in recognizing you know successful black areas of the past where we have and I know you mentioned yesterday like Dismal Swamp and other places where we have successfully defended our area and raised families and such, even though it's not the same time now. But I was wondering if you think that it would be wise for more of us, and I'm talking about a clandestine activity, not something where we post on Facebook, yeah, we got a black village here in Honduras or whatever, but do you think it would be wise if more of us quietly tried to get within the same area of each other because <clears throat> it seems like when you have more like-minded people around you, you can do more things. But the way we are now, we're pretty much separated or we're all congregated in certain areas like Atlanta or D.C. or Chicago. But I was wondering if you think it would be a good idea for more of us to get together in maybe little pockets around the world, but quietly build our own areas so that we can support each other so it becomes more of a natural thing to do so. Oh, definitely. Yeah, in fact, yes, because that's um, – and that's a natural um, – hold on one second. Oh, that is a natural, you know, development. That's a natural evolution of when people get involved and embrace cosmologically, they're on the same page then what happens is, you know, people naturally coalesce. Like we talk about ancestral ancestral spirits, you know, direct us to coalesce in a certain region of the earth mother's body. We, um, you know, blend ancestral blood circles and so forth. And then we engage in that nation building process, you know, guided by nationism, Amaniye and so forth. We'll naturally coalesce. We're naturally drawn together in different parts of the country. So it won't be a situation where, you know, you have one organization and everybody comes from all different parts of the country to all come join into one area because that's still kind of like a messianic nationalist type thing. And a lot of our people, you know, engage that kind of thing and it's always uh, fell apart. But in reality, when you're on the same page, you'll have, like you said, people all in different parts of the country establishing independent, you know, settlements and those will become networks across the country. It's the same thing we did after the so-called Civil War. Those who were engaged in real practice, ancestral religious practice, that independent black town movement, that's what, you know, jumped off. We had hundreds of independent black towns. Some of them were connected, you know, politically. They knew who was who and in what areas they were, and they 
they engaged even in trade as well. So, yes, that's a definitely, you know, that's definitely what will take place. That's a natural evolution of that process once we get on the same page cosmologically and ritually. Okay. Mirace. Okay. Mirace, we appreciate the call. And and we also appreciate the fact that our uh, sister brought up the fact that yes, that that natural inclination to instantaneously seek to support our own businesses, that has to be renewed within us because it's one thing to know intellectually that, hey, we should support black businesses. They are, you know, we spend, everybody knows the statistics, we spend a trillion dollars with the whites and their offspring. Well, we receive over a trillion dollars within our hands and spend 95 plus percent with our enemies and only the other 5% with our people. And, of course, we can ship hundreds of billions of those funds from white businesses to black businesses. But when you're conditioned against that, the sloganarian sounds good, but the actual practice, people still fall into. It's like someone on drugs and that people say, hey, you need to get off drugs because you need to exercise and get yourself healthy. And they're like, yeah, you're right. I do need to exercise. I need to stop doing this. Everything they say, the person tells them they agree with, but they're still addicted. So at the end of the day, they go back to utilizing the drugs and they do not work out. They don't you know, do anything healthy until they finally get into some form of rehabilitation, whether it's conventional or through ancestral religious practice and so forth, and then they begin to purify themselves, and then they are naturally inclined, just, you know, naturally, innately to, you know, engage in proper behavior. When we get back involved in ancestral religious practice, we realign ourselves in order, we have that natural inclination to support our own whenever and wherever we can. Now, it's been uh, taking place. You see how, for example, we, we talk about these. Uh, we always use the example of nearly 2 million black people unemployed, 1.9 to 2 million black businesses in America. We talked about if you shifted 10% of the $20 billion we spend per week, um, often just on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, 10% of 20 billion of that businesses, then we'll be able to hire, each black business can hire one of those people, one of those 2 million people uh, for 50,000 a year. We could solve the employment problem overnight. We could hire the entire 2 million black people, all of them at 50,000 a year, just by spending 10% of the money we normally waste for the whites in our spring and shifting it back to our community. The whites and their offspring, whether they're Asians, Hispanics, Europeans, Americans, or whatever, there's never a time when they think about, hey, let me go to a black business first and try to support them and spend 95% of all the money I make with black businesses. Let me run past a white business. Let me run past, you know, one of my own businesses and seek to support a black business. And then every now and then, once a year, I have a campaign to support a white business or I'll post some things on Facebook saying, hey, we need to support white businesses, but I'm spending all my money with black businesses. No Asians, Arabs, Hindus, or any, anybody ever even considers that. That's not part of their mindset. They instinctively support their own people, and they instinctively support the oppression of our people. They don't even entertain the idea of supporting anything we have. If they see a black business, and they're walking down the street, and they recognize it is a black business, they continue to walk because it's a black business. It's our people who, on the flip side, spend all of our funds with the whites and their offspring and then operate as though it's a, you know, like the sister said, a fad or, you know, just a, you know, a yearly little ritual to, okay, this Thanksgiving, we're going to, and Christmas season, we're not going to spend some money with the whites and their offspring, but the rest of the year, we're going to give them uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. But during this little period, we're going to, quote, unquote, shut them down. Of course, that has never happened. That's not going to happen just by putting a campaign out to shut down the Christmas season. Our people don't have enough funds to stop the Christmas season anyway. The Whites and Offspring are the major drivers of that nonsense. 
And, of course, they're participating because that's their perverse white culture. We don't need to be having little campaigns or slick campaigns to periodically support a black business. It should be innate and instinctive when we get up every day and every week. We should be consciously and deliberately seeking out a way to support some black business and thinking about what money we're spending with our enemies. And we're either, you're either supporting your enemies, financing your enemies, or you're financing yourself. That's no matter what dollar you spend, where you, whether you're buying toilet paper or whatever it is. So we need to be um, thinking on that level. But the only way you get there, like we said earlier, is we have to tra- transform that mindset, and that's part of the ancestral religious practice. Okay, so we have one more call on the phone line. I'm um, Ichiobo on the phone line, number 9440. You had a question or a comment? Ichiobo, Brother Quasi. Um, I'm calling because we were talking a lot about by black, and I I struggle with the specific concept regarding buying black. Um, in the area where I live, I live in Kansas City, um, and probably some people on this line will be offended because they live here, but we have organizations uh, like the Black United Front, and um, they really promote buying black. They actually sponsor an app, uh, Buy Black KC, and um, have various different initiatives. But um, I went to the Black Kwanzaa event that they had. I went two years in a row because I went the first time, and I was very dissatisfied, and I was encouraged by, you know, Black United Front member to attend a second time. Um both times they were promoting the sexuality, okay, both times. Um, and I was b- given a you know, bunch of different excuses like, well, you know, the people didn't audition first. You know, they just said they wanted to perform, and they accepted them without seeing the performance. And, um, but these performances were very detailed. It looked like they had been practiced. And there could have been no question what the theme of these, you know, um, these performances were even if someone had just said what do you you know what do you want to do so where i'm going is you know this is the organization in our area that kind of promotes the by black um and i know pretty much every single black, black business owner because i frequent you know their establishments so i've seen you know black united front members shun black business owners you know, that are engaged with the enemy, you know, as employees and things like that, which that makes sense to me. But then on the other side, I see them pushing the sexuality, you know, through their different events. So I guess what I'm leading up to is where do we draw the line? Because I'm at the point where uh, just this week I engaged a black business owner and while we're, you know, talking and, and going back and forth, um, you know, one of our enemies walks up, and, I mean, I would have thought that this was his best friend on the earth, right? Um, and that disturbed my peace, right, in a, in a really big way. And this is not the first time I've seen this with this particular business owner. Um, he'd been shunned from having lots of, you know, non-black employees. When I noticed with with you all, specifically with a Jeremiah, you all focus on those that are really engaged in African ancestral religion. Buy black has no specification. There's, there are no disclaimers. Just buy black. Um, are we supposed to, as a kind of like a 12-step program, endure these individuals that I feel like are just completely full of nonsense? You know, they they might as well not even be black as far as I'm concerned. And I'm not saying that in a derogatory fashion in the sense of I used to be one of them. You know, maybe not for the same reasons, but that level of ignorance and stupidity was still present. Where do we draw the line? Is it normal for us to just, you know, support these black-owned businesses, owners, until they know better? Or should we be discriminatory? And I'm saying this as a nation, not as me as an individual or you as an individual. What should it look like? Okay, so now there's a difference between, you know, of course, there are certain businesses, you know, we can connect with and support um, who are all, you know, grounded in ancestral religious culture. And we should Mm -hmm. support those first and foremost, especially, I mean, they have the you know, products that we need. The good thing about the Internet is there are a lot of things that we used to only be able to get 
you know, at a place that we would have to go and actually drive to or walk to and so forth. And now there are a lot of things that we can get order online and we can seek out black businesses online. There are certain things we have. Now, there are certain other things that we don't have access to as far as, for example, we're not manufacturing cars or certain other things. So we're, certain things we're going to have to purchase from the whites in their offspring, or if we can find, you know, a black car dealer, at least they will get the commission and so forth. Um, and there are even certain other kinds of products. There are certain things that we will purchase that we're not manufacturing right now. So, you know, we will still have to get them from somewhere. And the best case scenario is to, you know, if there's a black owned store that's selling those products, even if the people are not culturally grounded, if you're, spending money there, you're keeping the black people who work there employed. And there, there's some, some people live in certain towns where there's no black business at all. Like there's no right. black retail store at all. But then they're going right. to one retail store to purchase some things and 100% of the employees are white. They go into another retail store, say if it was a CVS, you know, one CVS in one area, and it's all white employees. One CVS in the other area, it's all black employees. We go to the one where it's all black employees because we know if we go there, those people are, you know, being paid and they're going to, you know, pay rent and buy food for their children and everything else. You'd rather support that, quote, unquote, white-owned business that's employing black people than the white-owned business that's employing white people or other Mexicans and so forth. So we make those kind of decisions. Most of the black businesses are not culturally grounded. Some of them are, a handful of them are, most of them are not yet because we're still engaged in that educational process. But if you're going to make a decision about what business you're going to support, if it's supporting black people who are actually working and they're employed and we're keeping black people employed, then we would support that business as opposed to a white business that's supporting white Asians, white Mexicans, white Europeans, and so forth. You know, and as, you know, as we, people get more support, then they, we can also engage the educational process as well, those individuals. I, I guess I guess what my question is more, not so much even as, you know, purchasing products from our enemies as an option, you know, if, if we can get it from us. What I'm trying to say is I'm just, I'm trying to understand this, people push buying black, but you see people doing things that are just very, self-destructive, you know, like when, I, when I'm going to some of these businesses, for example, there are a couple of business owners in Kansas City, they're drug dealers. I mean, they, everybody knows they, they're actually drug dealers. Like what, are we just not at the point where we can say, yes, I buy black. Yes, I'm committed to buying black. I won't go to a white-owned business, you know, for something I can get from a, you know, black-owned business owner. But it's like, I, I don't see any accountability in the buy black. Are we just not there yet? Well, yeah, some of us are not, I mean, like, something like that. If somebody's engaged in, you know, selling drugs and poison in the community, supporting them is just going to uh, have the effect of perpetuating the poison directly in the community. These are enemies within the community. They don't need any support at all. They're no different than the whites and their offspring at that point. So we're just supporting our own demise by supporting them. Or some Negroes who are claiming to be culturally grounded but then they're promoting dissexuality, homosexuality. For individuals like that, they're perpetuating the exact poison that's designed to destroy the moral and spiritual fabric of the community, so they don't deserve any support either. They need to go out of business, and then we support some other black business that's providing the same uh, products. So if one is criminal or one is promoting you know, white culture heavily and deliberately, then we don't, they don't need our support at all. They can fold, and then we can connect. Even if you connect with a, you know, a quote-unquote mainstream black business owner, but they're not promoting this sexuality or something insane like drug dealing, but, right. you know, they just don't know anything about culture, but they're employing black people. Right, right. So, you know, I guess, I guess that's because some places, like where I live in Kansas City, we really don't suffer from a shortage of black-owned businesses. You know, our black-owned business owners suffer from not having support, but it's not because they don't exist. It's just because we're not really supporting them. But I have started to see because we have this buy black 
kind of fetish going on in Kansas City that more and more business owners in the last, you know, five to seven years have emerged, but they've emerged, you know, as owners that are really poisonous to the community and, and nobody's talking about it. You know, like my example I gave was the Black United Front. It's like, hey, you can't be with a white woman. But on the flip side, this particular business owner is doing far more to the community. You know what I'm saying? The same, you know what I'm saying? The same business owner is selling drugs in the community. But that wasn't talked about. It's like, hey, you, you know, you got, you're dating a white woman. Right. No, I know what you mean. Yeah, it's, you know, that kind of hypocrisy and things like that. So, yeah, we, um, people who are, it's, it's one thing if somebody's ignorant of something, like, you know, just a regular black business owner that may own a, you know, auto supply store or something like that, something that's needed in the community. They don't know anything about culture, but they're just, you know, providing a product or a service, and then they're also employing their own people. Then we support those kind of businesses. But if it's somebody claiming to embrace culture, but then they're also perpetuating at the same time the degenerate culture of the whites and their offspring, they're being subversive, and those don't deserve any kind of support. Okay, okay. I just I just wanted to get a little bit of clarification on that because sometimes this pushing by black, it's like we're not giving our people any disclaimer that says, okay, but that doesn't mean support the drug dealers. <laughs> like that doesn't mean right. go out and support, you know, the disexual. Um, and so I just wanted to hear that, make sure I'm on the same page, because that's that's how I was feeling. But I've had some people kind of come at me like, you know, you're being too judgmental, like with the closet thing. I got up and left. I'm just not going to sit through, you know, a transgender performance, you know, and it's supposed to be all black. And then the next performance was a jazz performance. It's like five white people and two black people on the stage. So I think it's just we have to be – you know, a little more mature and say, if they're not really helping us, then buy black doesn't apply in this situation. Right. Exactly. Definitely. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mendoza. Okay. Yeah, I'll say it all. We appreciate the call. Uh, okay. So that was the um, last call on the phone line. So again, um, yet I say for tuning in, if you would like to whether attend the uh the retreat in February, of course, go to the Hoppy Metary page. If you support the work that we are doing, please contribute to our we're in the final push for our film, the documentary film, the crowdfunding page. You'll see that on the website, Amado Kapo Adibisa Ajumari. You'll see we posted, of course, the trailer and everything on our Facebook page, Kwesi Akan on Facebook. Um as well as on our OGRFO.com page and so forth, and the various different broadcasts, you'll see that link, uh, you know, in the informational section of the broadcast. Again, we want to get that done within the next, as far as completing the film work within the next 30 days, So we, but we can reach that 100%. If we got to a 49% with about 97 people over the past year, we definitely the other 51% rather quickly. We've had a, a three or four donations in the past um, couple of days, so we can definitely get to that point. We have thousands of people download the books on a monthly basis, so we can definitely do that. We just need to, as the sister was saying, that notion of buying black and supporting businesses that are actually doing work in the community that benefits the community. We have that capacity. We have that propensity, that innate inclination we need to act on that and just see where we would have spent funds with the whites and their offspring, employing the whites and their offspring, and starve the beast and feed the pride, and we can engage that process naturally. So, again, yet I say we thank you for tuning in to the broadcast. Send us an email if you have any questions about the Hapi Metairie Retreat. And Yebeshi Abio, we will meet again. Adele.